divining the stones, dowsing, the earth mysteries and the spiritual journey, presented by Sig Longren. In this lecture, Sig looked at why dowsers get different results in their research and gives an overview of how the ancients may have worked with the ancient science of geomancy. Recorded live at Megalithomania Conference 2006. Thank you very much. Um, I, I have the feeling that I'm not going to be able to tell you anything new. Uh, everybody's already said what I wanted to say, but I trust you'll hear it in a different way and that it'll work for you. Um, yes, this is our uh, shield that we all saw to, to come here. And of course, the big question is at the bottom of this, just what were those ancients up to? Now, I think we've had a lot of answers today as to what were they up to in the sense of they were into astronomy or they were up to doing sacred geometry or they were up to making long distance alignments or, or, or. But why were they up to that? Oh. There you go. Uh, so the <clears throat> topic of my talk is divining the stones. Dowsing the Earth Mysteries and the Spiritual Journey. I want to start with um, uh, the square. And actually, uh, from a symbolic level, I'm going to be moving backwards. Um, the square, as you all have heard and I'm sure are well aware, uh, represents the physical. In that it can be totally defined rationally. Uh, the distance around the perimeter, if the side is one, its, its perimeter is four. And if it's one, whatever the unit is, it's one square, its area. It can be absolutely and totally defined. And therefore, it represents the physical. <clears throat> it also, I think, represents the rational. Because it can be rationally totally understood. On the other hand, the circle uh, represents the spiritual. And it repre represents the spiritual because of this little number called pi. And it cannot be defined as totally as the square. It cannot be totally empirically defined. And if I have a spiritual experience, and I want to come back and talk to you about it, I can't give it to you, or to you, or to you, with the same degree of accuracy, and you cannot experience it, with the same degree of accuracy uh, as I experienced it. I can only get close to it, which is what pi allows us to do with the circumference of this circle, uh, which we cannot define with as great a degree of accuracy as the square. Now, um, having said that, uh, actually before I talk about Bruce, I want to say that I think that there was a time, as Merlin Stone said, when God was a woman. And uh, it was called the Paradise Papers over here, which was a horrible name. Uh, but it was in the early 70s. And I think there was a time when none of us needed any of the things we've been talking about today. None of us needed uh, alignments, astronomy, uh, any of those things. None of us needed shaman. We all had our own right brain, if you will, uh, intuitive way uh, of communicating with uh, the other worlds, which is what I actually think all of this is about. It's about the spiritual path. And we all had our own ways and our own abilities to do that. But the closer we get to the present, the closer we get to the late Neolithic and then into the Bronze Age, the more we begin to see it was necessary to build places that enhanced that connect, the possibility of connection. Uh, the, the sacred geometry is used to get us to resonate at the right frequency, at the proper frequency. Uh, the hallucinogenic drugs were used to enhance the possibility of connection. Uh, and then uh, the, the astronomy, from my perception, was used to tell us when a particular site was going to be at its hottest spiritually. Not all sites are of equal spiritual hotness, if you will, 
uh, throughout the year. There are certain times when they're stronger than others, but the sacred geometry got them to work for longer periods of time. I think one of my best examples I learned from John a long time ago, uh, John Michelle, when he was talking about when we were hunter-gatherers, we were naturally in the right place at the right time. If we followed the herds up into the mountains in the summer, and then down into the valleys in the winter, we were naturally at the right place when it was at its peak energetically from a uh, uh, ability to communicate, to contact point of view. But when we became farmers and lived down in the valleys, we had to figure out how to make it work more often. And the sacred geometry and the astronomy and all of those were used, and the, and the, and the hallucinogenic drugs and the shamanic uh, activities were used to increase the possibility of connection. Um, we get closer and closer to the Greeks, and we see it's getting more and more difficult. I think human sacrifice, for example, is an absolute clear evidence that that culture is forgetting how to connect. And they've got to go to such horrible extremes to get that connection. Uh, another example that's used, I think, uh, that shows us from a sacred space point of view that's cut us off is the rood screen. Now, the first rood screen I know of is called Stonehenge. Stonehenge and the big henges, the big trilithons, were in effect rood screens that separated the folks out on the circle, out by the Aubrey holes, watching the activity inside. And the priests on the inside, you couldn't quite clearly see what it was that they were up to. And of course, the cathedrals carried that on. You go to Wells, and they've got an organ between the people and the high altar. So you can't possibly see what's going on there. And so we stepped further and further away from being able to do it ourselves directly, and closer and closer to um, <clears throat> having other people do it for us. The Greeks have a really good example of this in their theater. I think theater is one step away from ceremony. And then they built the proscenium arch, this thing here, which separates you guys from me and makes you as observers, and I'm the, I'm the action, right? And they had a theatrical uh, convention that was accepted in Greek tragedy all the time, which was essentially things get so screwed up and so tight and twisted that all of a sudden they lower this, this god comes out of the proscenium on a, on a string in a box, right? And he resolves everything. Now the term for this theatrical uh, uh, <coughs> convention is called deus ex machina. You may have noticed that wasn't Greek. It's Roman. It's Latin. And what they were, it's God out of a machine, and it means a contrived ending. And the Romans looked back on these contrived endings and said, oh, that's just, you couldn't figure out how to make it work, so you contrived it. But the reality is that the Greeks understood when you get under that kind of pressure, that's just when psycho-spiritual phenomena can occur, can occur. That's the time when mom can actually lift the wrecked car so her son can crawl out. And that happens. But it happens under times of extreme tension and extreme stress when the God out of the machine comes and speaks to us. Well, I could go on in our journey from our right brain when God was a woman to our left brain with the, with the Romans to what we have today when we are more represented less of the square of the circle, which was the goddess, and more of the square, which is the scientist the rational brain. Now I want to give you a little bit of history of my own in terms of my heritage as a dowser, which is what this talk is about. Dowsing is a tool that can bring up consciousness, uh, intuition on demand. Now I want you to raise your hand when you know the answer to this question, right? Okay, everybody with me? How much is five and seven? Raise your hand when you know the answer. Very good, very good. You all went to school, didn't you? You all were trained in your left brain how to come up with an answer like that. We've all been trained in our left brain. But if I were to ask you, um, is this avocado that I'm holding here ripe? 
How many of you have the immediate answer? Well, maybe you squeeze it a little or whatever. But there are intuitional ways that you can get answers to questions that the rational brain doesn't give you access to. I've lost my wedding ring. Where is it? Those kinds of questions. Now, one of the people who really began to talk to me and to us about the energies that can be found in a sacred space, we've talked about alignments, astronomical alignments, we've talked about, am I crackling too much? Oh no, you're not coming to tell me I'm crackling. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, one of the uh, one of the people who began to talk to us about something beyond the the um, uh, astronomy and the geometry and the other things that I've been talking about so far was a guy named Bruce McManaway. Now Bruce was um, an officer in the British uh, military at Gun Dunkirk, and he was in the perimeter holding the Jerry's back, and um, his unit ran out of medical supplies. And he didn't have anything but his hands, and he had men bleeding all over him. And so he used his hands, and it worked. And the bleeding stopped, and his particular unit suffered the lowest level of shock and battle wounds, uh, unrecoverable battle wounds of any in the perimeter. And it's where he learned that he was a healer. And he became one of the big healers in the last century. He uh, set up a healing center in Strathmiglo in Fife, in Scotland. And um, he was a wonderful, wonderful healer. And many of the terms that I use today when I'm talking about the earth energies as a dowser, I owe to Bruce McManaway. Terry Ross is another one that I owe a great deal. He was one of my field faculty for my master's degree, and he brought the notion of dowsable lays to the United States. And I owe him a great deal in terms of working with geomancy, geo, uh, the earth, mancy, divination of the earth. Uh, and he certainly taught me how to do that, and he was a student of Bruce McManaway's. Uh, John Williams. Uh, a Welshman uh, who uh, learned about the idea of getting spun off a stone. If you had come with us to Stanton Drew on Friday, you would have had a chance to lean against a standing stone and literally get spun off. And he was one of the first people to discover this. And he also uh, was looking into a particular kind of line, I think he called them skim lines, that were uh, uh, somewhat analogous to the lays. Here he is getting thrown off the stone. He could do it from a distance. He was quite skilled. Uh, Tom Graves. Tom Graves uh, used to live in the next town here. When I first came to Glastonbury, I tell my British friends, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of moving to England. I think it's really going to be great. I'm going to love it over here. You've probably guessed I'm not English. <laughs> I, I, am a, I am a British citizen, and I have taken an oath to the Queen. Everybody who's taken an oath to the Queen, please raise your hand. Nobody's hands are going up. Very few. Very good. Well, so them yeah on you. Uh, but in any event, uh, Tom said, um, "Don't um, uh, you're coming to Glastonbury? No, don't 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 go to Glastonbury. Come live in Street." And everybody who I told I was coming to England, uh, they all said, "Oh no, don't don't go to Glastonbury. No, 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 don't don't live there." And I finally went to a guy who was a fundraiser at Oxford. He said, "Nobody in their right mind lives in Glastonbury." Well, in 1985, I want to assure you that everybody in Glastonbury from the alternative community that, that was called the New Age back then, um, everyone was living in their right mind. It was the rest of Britain who was living in their left mind. And um, in any event, Glastonbury was the place where we learned how to live in our right brain. And Tom, a dowser, now lives in Australia, but he was one of the people who really uh, got us going in terms of understanding of dowsing and uh, the needles of stone, the earth acupuncture needles of standing stones. Oh, here's a guy you may have seen before. Um, <clears throat> When people talk about ley lines, I don't know what they're talking about. The gentlemen who discovered these rediscovered these alignments of sites were called uh, Alfred Watkins called them lays. He didn't call them ley lines. And when I was coming over here in the in the late seventies, John said, "Please don't call those things you're dowsing lays." 
those straight alignments of Yang energy, those six to eight foot wide beams of Yang energy that many times, but not always, run cons concurrently with Watkins' lays. So I've called them energy lays. And I have to say, uh, in John's intro introduction, he's the reason I'm here. His book, View Over Atlantis, was one of the first. Uh, was, I had two books, uh, Secret Country by Janet and Colin Board and View Over Atlantis, and they were the ones that turned me on. And I really honor John for what he's done for all of us in this room. Uh, Werner Heisenberg, how did he get in here? Well, uh, he was dealing with quantum mechanics. And he talks about how the observer and the system being observed became mysteriously linked so that the results of any observation seem to be determined in part by actual choices made by the observer. In other words, there's no such thing as an objective observer. And here we are, the granddaddy of all quantum weirdness, the infamous double slip experiment. To understand this experiment, we first need to see how particles, or little balls of matter, act. If we randomly shoot a small object, say a marble, at the screen, we see a pattern on the back wall where they went through the slit and hit. Now, if we add a second slit, we would expect to see a second band duplicated to the right. Now, let's look at waves. The waves hit the slit and radiate out striking the back wall with the most intensity directly in line with the slit. The line of brightness on the back screen shows that intensity. This is similar to the line the marbles make. But when we add the second slit, something different happens. If the top of one wave meets the bottom of another wave, they cancel each other out. So now, there is an interference pattern on the back wall. Places where the two tops meet are the highest intensity, the bright lines, and where they cancel, there is nothing. So, when we throw things, that is, matter, through two slits, we get this. Two bands of hits. And with waves, we get an interference pattern of many bands. Good so far. Now, let's go quantum. <laughs> An electron is a tiny, tiny bit of matter, like a tiny marble. Let's fire a stream through one slit. It behaves just like the marble, a single band. So, if we shoot these tiny bits through two slits, we should get, like the marbles, two bands. What? An interference pattern. We fired electrons, tiny bits of matter, through. But we get a pattern like waves, not like little marbles. How? How could pieces of matter create an interference pattern like a wave? It doesn't make sense. But physicists are clever. They thought, maybe those little balls are bouncing off each other and creating that pattern. So, they decide to shoot electrons through one at a time. There is no way they could interfere with each other. But after an hour of this, the same interference pattern is seen to emerge. The conclusion is inescapable. The single electron leaves as a particle, becomes a wave of potentials, goes through both slits and interferes with itself to hit the wall like a particle. But mathematically, it's even stranger. It goes through both slits and it goes through neither. And it goes through just one and it goes through just the other. All of these possibilities are in superposition with each other. But physicists were completely baffled by this. So they decided to peek and see which slit actually goes through. They put a measuring device by one slit to see which one it went through and let it fly. <laughs> but the quantum world 
is far more mysterious than they could have imagined. When they observed, the electron went back to behaving like a little marble. It produced a pattern of two bands, not an interference pattern of many. The very act of measuring or observing which slit it went through meant it only went through one, not both. The electron decided to act differently, as though it was aware it was being watched. And it was here that physicists stepped forever into the strange never world of quantum events. What is matter? Marbles or waves? And waves of what? And what does an observer have to do with any of this? The observer collapsed the wave function simply by observing. Just when I gave up. So the observer affects the observed. Every single scientific attempt to prove dowsing exists since 1900, from the first three pipes under the ground, which one has water going over it, every single one of these tests was performed by people who are hot dowsers. Uh, Bill Lewis in this country, for example, who was one of the master dowsers of last century, every single one of these tests failed. Every single time you're dealing with things that get close to intangible, the observer, the scientific observer, affects the result. But what does this have to do with dowsing and the Earth energies? <clears throat> what does this button have to do with advancing the film? There we go. People are into the Earth mysteries for at, least, for at least two different reasons, and I suspect we'll find some of both of you here in this room today. The researchers, people who call themselves Earth mystery researchers, are into the Earth mysteries for scientific reasons. They want to use science to prove that the Earth mysteries have validity. They want to convince archaeologists that astro archaeoastronomical alignments are real. They want to convince uh, people that sacred geometry is really part of what's going on here. Uh, the biggest one, they want to convert, convince the archaeologists that lays are real. Historically, in the Earth mysteries, there have been some difficulties with this approach. This is the world's largest understatement. Um, I need to switch to something that uh, is a topic that also has been talked about here, fundamentalism. Whether you're talking about whatever religion you want, I think it's a real problem. Uh, my paradigm, paradigm of reality is truth, and it's the only correct one and you're going to hell. <laughs> now, the problem is, in this issue that's really big in the United States, and my dear friends, it is coming to this country, in the evolution versus intelligent design controversy. I spoke that in British, I'm proud of myself. And <clears throat> the problem is that it's, again, clearly science versus creationism and religion. But the real problem is that the scientists are just as fundamentalist as the people in the church. My paradigm of evolution is correct, and you're crazy. When you hold a worldview that doesn't allow for anybody else's point of view to come in, there's bound to be conflict. And the point is that each one of us have our own sacred point of view. Each one of us in this room have our own paradigm of reality. But the thing that we need to do, and here's a little preaching here, the thing that we need to do in the Earth Mysteries is to start respecting other people's paradigms and understand that we're all blind men looking at women, 
looking at the elephant. And we each see that sacred space elephant slightly differently, and we're all correct from our own points of view. And if there's one message I can get to you today, that would be the one that I would do. How much time do I have, please? Thank you. Okay. So the diviners, if the scientists are square, uh, the diviners or the pilgrims um, are the circle. And we each see intangible targets differently. I heard a really neat quote on uh, the Beeb the other day of Philip Pullman when he was talking about scientists versus um, oh pilgrims or diviners or whatever. He said, science seeks facts. Pilgrims, people into a mythology, diviners seek truth. I think that's a real difference. And the truth that I'm seeking is the spiritual truth for me. Relativism, the truth or falsity of moral judgments or their justification is not absolute or universal, but is relative to the traditions, convictions, and practices of a group of persons. An example. Chalice Well. Perhaps some of you know about Chalice Well here in town. If you have uh, never been to Chalice Well, please go there before you leave Glastonbury. You're in for a real treat. But in any event, dowsers have been dowsing Chalice Well for yonks. This dowser, oh me, um, sees the blind, the elephant, this blind man sees the elephant, sacred space elephant, in terms of underground water and what I would call energy lays, which are six to eight foot wide beams of straight yang energy, which sometimes flow concurrently with Watkins lays. The underground water is the yin, the earth mother, and the energy lays, those straight lines, are the solar father. And you can see that I see an energy lay here, crossing over the, the chalice well here where several others cross. There's a dome of water there as well, and a couple of others coming through here. I find the Arthur's Court is quite a powerful place as well. Um, that's how this blind man sees the elephant. Did I skip one? How did it go back? Um, Hamish Miller who is one of the master dowsers of this country of this day, <clears throat> uh, was dowsing John's Michael line, and he found that it didn't go in a straight line, but he, it went kind of like this, and then when he went back to check it again, and found another one that went like that, and he called them the Michael and Mary lines. And he tra traced them through the um, uh, Chalicewell Garden, uh, coming through here, going in that direction. Uh, this is the Michael line, that's the Mary line. Now, somebody during the con uh, our time together talked about how um, one of those lines moved as a result of something. Do you remember somebody saying that? Um, well, that's okay. We each see it our own way. And a really good example of this is a student of uh, Hamish's by the name of Tony Kennish, who lives here in town. And he did a dowse of the Michael and Mary lines in Chalice Well. And you'll see that it's quite different from what uh, Hamish found. And in fact, he found that the Michael and Michael line had split into two. So each one of us sees it differently. This is anathema to science. We all ought to find the same thing. <clears throat> so we come back to the square being the physical, and the circle representing the spiritual. Now, they're all different views of the spiritual. Um, listen, I'm a Methodist, and in this particular place in the service, we all kneel. Oh, oh, no. No, I'm a Congregationalist, and in this one, uh, at this point, we stand. Uh, oh, no, we sit at this one in the Catholic Church. We all see that one, that numinous, that spiritual, differently. And it depends upon our level of consciousness and what our expectations are and what we're ready to see that determines what we're going to see. 
And that might turn me into a Muslim, it might turn me into a Jew, it might turn me into a Buddhist. Um, all of the founders of those religions all saw the one. I have no doubt that Confucius and Jesus and Lao Tzu and Krishna and Buddha and Muhammad and forgive me for who I've forgotten, they all saw the one. But they all came back and told different stories. They were the circle. They didn't use the same words. They couldn't describe it with empirical accuracy. So the point here, for me, is something that I call gnowing. And gnowing comes from Gnostic, but I have to say the hard G or you won't hear what I'm talking about. And it is, um, <clears throat> listen, I really appreciate what you have to say, and I want to hear what you have to say. And you, sir, I want to hear what you have to say. And John, I want to hear what you have to say. And Chris, and, and uh, Father in Rome, and who, uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, and uh, George Bush. And, um, <clears throat> but thank you, ultimately, I'll make up my own mind. And that's because I value the rational and the intuitive equally and I'm going to decide for myself. And that, for me, is one of the meanings of squaring the circle, or circling the square, I like that better. And um, it also has to do with bringing the physical body and the spiritual body into oneness. So what exactly were the ancients up to? Why have so many of us put so much time into these ancient sites? What have dowsers and so many other seekers been looking for? Well, we've been looking... John, are you in this picture? Yeah, he is. Here's John right here. Um, we've been looking in many different ways to hook into the spiritual. And there are many different ways to do it. There's no right way whatsoever. Um, here's a group that are meeting in a stone ring up in, in Scotland. Um, uh, there is no right way, although I would say... The most, I'm, I, you notice I haven't brought my dowsing tools up with me. I'm not into teaching you how to douse. But if you're going to douse, I think the most important thing you can do in a sacred space, to heck with the energies. To heck with that kind of stuff. What I think what you need to do is find out where do I need to put my young ass right now. And go there, sit down, and shut up. In other words, pay attention Go to that one place that is best for you and be quiet and see what happens. Say a prayer, give an offering, take some LSD, do whatever it is you're going to do. But I think that is what is really the use of sacred space. It, it, they are places that enhance the possibility of spiritual connection and, <clears throat> and they don't work the same for everyone. Each of us will find that some places are more powerful than others. Each of us will find that some places within that um, will be the same, more powerful. I uh, did a class at Chalice Well one time, and I asked people to say, said, um, think of your two most favorite places in Chalice Well. Then get together with someone else and go to those four places, because I assume they were each had two, and dows where your aura is most expanded because that's what happens in power centers, your aura is expanded. And then tonight, we're going to go to that one place, you go to your place, and um, we'll, I'll give you some uh, meditational things to do. And it came time to be doing these meditational things, and I went to the place that I wanted to do, which was at the wellhead. No one else was there. I just assumed everyone would go to the wellhead. Mm-mm. Each of us have our own places within the sacred space where we can connect the most effectively. Uh, went too fast. Uh, this is another example. This is at Arbor Low, and people doing a little uh, walking ceremony and a spiral dance. Uh, again, there's no right thing to be doing in sacred spaces. I don't come to you with a particular spiritual path in mind. I honor all paths with heart. And um, uh, take what works for you and bring it to sacred space and go for it. Now, one uh, exercise that I did give to uh, the folks at Stanton Drew, uh, we'll just go to this next one here just to show another sacred tool. Oh, George, I am talking about labyrinths. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, this is Bremer. 
It's Charsh Labyrinth in, uh, near uh, Bournemouth, north. But in any event, go to a sacred place and find where your spot is. And then when you go home and you find yourself getting into a tight place, starting to take a, uh, an exam, or you're going to meet with your boss, or you've got to take your driver's test, or whatever could be stressful, and just before you go in, go to that place in your mind. Take a couple of deep breaths and center down, and it will help you deal with what's in front of you. So there's no right way to douse. The pendulum goes clockwise or counterclockwise or back and forth or side to side, all the different signals that different dowsers get. There's no right way to douse. There's no right way to use sacred space. But friends, use it for what it was made for. Use it to enhance the possibility of spiritual connection. This is Chalice Well, the place that I was drawn to, the wellhead. So this is what they were looking for. They were looking for union, which is, uh, I think, another word for yoga. Oh, gosh, that went fast. Yes, thank you. Go there and square the circle. Bring your body to these portals, these sacred places, and use them to grow spiritually. Say a prayer that you know. Chant a chant that you chant. Listen to nature and see what nature may say to you. But please, use these places for spiritual growth. And that's what I think dowsers are all about. Learning how to enhance their intuition so that they can be better gnowers and to grow towards the spirit. Thank you very much. This has been a Megalithomania audio production. For more information, visit megalithomania.co.uk.